After 28 years, DNA from the clothes worn by six-year-old Ricky Neve on the day of his tragic demise matched with James Watson, the then-teenage killer who had managed to evade justice for such a long time. Despite his mother's malevolence in raising her children, she seemed burdened with remorse and guilt for her unforgiving actions driving her to seek her son's murderer. Ricky's sisters were also determined to unravel the baffling mystery and bring the killer to justice. But what truly transpired in the household where Ricky and his sisters were raised and what events unfolded on the day of Ricky's murder allowing this perpetrator to escape the law's grasp for so long? Ricky Lee Harvey was born on March 4, 1988 in the city of Peterborough, located in the county of Cambridgeshire in England to Trevor Harvey and Ruth Ann Gregg. Ruth's life had been marked by turmoil from an early age with her being placed in foster care at the mere age of two. Her younger brother who was born blind, at the tender age of one had already been placed in foster care. She endured a challenging journey through various foster homes before returning to her parents' care forever changed by the abuse and insults she suffered while she was under foster care. Her empathy and affection dwindled with time which was an observation made and reported by her mother to the authorities a struggle that the mother had been dealing with too for quite some time. Tragedy struck again when Ruth's parents took their own lives as a suicide pact later on leaving her to face the world alone once again. At 16 she crossed paths with Trevor Harvey, settling in Cambridgeshire and giving birth to their first child Rebecca Maria Harvey in 1986 and went on to have Ricky two years later. Their happiness was short-lived as Trevor and Ruth separated when Ricky was only three but Ruth met Dean Neve not long after. They married and welcomed their first daughter into the world and named her Rochelle Neve. The family later on moved into the Welland estate in Peterborough in 1992. Ruth decided to change Ricky's surname to match her new husband's and he was now known as Ricky Neve. Some time later they welcomed another daughter and named her Sheridan Neve. They lived in Red Mile Walk which was a part of the Welland estate that was well known for its association with crime and drug use. Unfortunately the family's new home was riddled with challenges as Dean Neve was a notorious drug dealer and Ruth had succumbed to addiction. She would even spend a lot on drugs to a point of neglecting her children's basic needs. Ricky and his sisters often wandered the estate without proper care, food, or clothing drawing concern from neighbors who bravely reported the situation to social services. Ricky was the one who took care of his siblings when they were starved as he would nick something from the shops and bring it to feed his siblings. He loved being clean so he also made sure they were clean by running a bath for them. Dean was rarely at home and Ruth often blamed Ricky for this, claiming that he was always away since he hated his stepson. This made her start hating Ricky as she would write to Dean during his prison stints how she had hurt him by punching him and burning him with matches and how she even wanted to kill him. She hated him more as she claimed that he would always laugh at her. The neighbors often seeing the children outside had no idea what really happened in that house. Ruth tortured and demeaned the innocent children, often burning them with cigarettes, calling them all sorts of names which at one point she wrote idiot on their foreheads and forced them not to rub it off. She would force them to stand for long periods of time while she smacked them on the head. She sent them to buy her drugs even after starving them. An allegation was made that she had even been seen hanging Ricky over a bridge by his ankles. One time she forced Ricky to swallow liquid soap who at the point of struggling to breathe uttered the words, I love you mummy. She would strangle the daughters to unconsciousness and even beat them with a hairbrush to the point of breaking it. They were even locked naked in rooms full of urine. The children tried to get the attention of their neighbors which was often in vain as their cries were not heard by them. 
Ricky was placed at the at-risk register after Ruth warned the child services repeatedly that she would kill him. He was taken into short care to give the mother some time, however his files were mismanaged. Ruth, despite the clear evidence of the burns, cuts, and bruises on the children, would get away with it through her false explanations and excuses of accidents and even blaming Ricky for being clumsy on his part. Rebecca was taken into care, but Ricky remained with Ruth. Maurice Harvey, the paternal grandfather, would pick Ricky from time to time to stay with him and his wife, but no matter how long they stayed with him, the moment he returned to Ruth, she would pick up from where she had left off. On this fateful day of November 28, 1994, Ricky woke up ready to go to school as usual, or perhaps contemplate the idea of skipping it which was a habit that had now become somewhat common for him. The school was even used to his truancy as he'd show up less and less as time went by. At around 9.30 am, he had Weetabix for his breakfast and left for school, and as you probably guessed he never actually went to school. The school being used to his recent truancy habits didn't even call his mother to inform her of Ricky's absence in school. In fact, he hadn't even shown up to school the previous day as well. Ricky had apparently gone for his usual walks when he evaded school, only this time he never returned. In the evening his mother after seeing that the usual time for Ricky to come home was way past she called the police and notified them of her son's failure to come back home. Family and friends were also informed and they were out the whole night searching for Ricky but surprisingly or unsurprisingly Ruth stayed at home. On the next day of November 29th, unfortunately, Ricky's lifeless body was found in a wooded area off the I Road near Paston Parkway, which was less than a mile away from his house. He usually visited that area most of the time where he played with his friends. His body was found in the woods naked, lying flat on his back and in a deliberately star-shaped pose similar to Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of the Vitruvian Man. His clothes were found later in a trash can nearby. The police informed the mother what they found and also informed the family including Maurice Harvey who had been actively searching for his grandson the moment he learned about his disappearance. The devastating news left him in such a state that he couldn't bring himself to go for the body's identification so his son Ricky's father Trevor Harvey went instead. A murder investigation was in place with an autopsy determining the cause of death to be strangulation by his own jacket. It was determined that the force of strangulation had probably led to his death in less than a minute. The investigators determined that Ricky had not put up a fight and willingly followed the attacker into the woods possibly unaware of the impending danger. At that point, no one had any clear idea of who was responsible for the murder. Some witnesses reported seeing Ricky with someone who would later be identified as the murderer, but let's hold that information for later. There weren't really any prime suspects as everyone was suspicious, but the police at first looked into Dean Neve, who at the time didn't live with Ruth and the kids. However, his alibi checked out as he wasn't near the scene at the possible time that the murder was being committed. He was in fact busy trying to steal a motorcycle on that day. All lights were now pointed towards Ricky's mother, who increasingly started to appear more and more as the potential perpetrator of the murder. The intense animosity she harbored for her own children which she had confessed about on multiple occasions along with issuing death threats towards them raised suspicions as a possible motive for the crime and the police had to consider it as a potential lead. While searching Ruth's house, the police uncovered occultist magazines and books indicating her fascination with mysticism and occult practices including the use of Ouija boards. Various murder and crime magazines were also found and this started painting a picture of her being the suspect. To add more paint to that picture, a piece of writing by Ruth herself had been found which was titled The Perfect Murder which was a first-person account of the perfect murder about a fellow who killed women. 
Months prior to this incident, she had given her writing to a social worker for review. However, having a thrill for crime stories or even writing them doesn't necessarily imply that someone would actually commit a murder, otherwise you and I would be in jail by now. Suspects were interviewed, but none was found. The eventual perpetrator behind the murder was also interviewed, but had given a lying account of his whereabouts. Amidst the various theories emerging from every direction, it became clearly evident that the common suspect in most residents' minds, if not everyone, was Ruth. Ruth was arrested on January of 1995 with suspicion of the murder of her own son. During that very month, she faced charges of cruelty and neglect under the Children's Act and also appeared at Peterborough Magistrate's Court accused of cruelty towards Ricky and one of her other children. In May of 1995, Ruth was charged with the murder of her son and offenses of cruelty to him and two of his sisters. Her trial, however, would begin the following year on October 1996 at the Northampton Crown Court where prosecutors told the jury that Ricky and his siblings were treated with cruelty and neglect with witness statements backing this as well. Her numerous death threats to her son led to the prosecution concluding that Ricky was killed in a sacrifice by his mother. She admitted to charges of neglect and cruelty but denied any involvement in relation to her son's murder. The entire case hinged on the testimony of a policeman who on the night of Ricky's disappearance stated that he had not found the child's body during his search of the woods where Ricky was eventually discovered. The prosecution had however claimed the officer might have missed it in the dark. The jurors acquitted Ruth convinced that she couldn't have moved Ricky's body since the police were with her at the said time. However, she was sentenced to seven years in jail for the cruelty towards Ricky and his sisters, charges to which she had already confessed to. Flash forward to 2000 she was released but all this time the killer still remained a mystery. In 2008 she met Gary Rogers who ended up marrying her and by then Ricky's murder had already become a cold case and the police had given up. Rogers promised Ruth that he would give her all the support she needed to reopen the case and try to find the killer, however this was easier said than done. In 2013, with the help of Cambridgeshire Times editor John Elworthy, they worked tirelessly to campaign for the reopening of the case and eventually succeeded in doing so. Rogers managed to secure the original files from Ruth's former solicitor, which was a collection of 13 boxes with 8 to 12 ring binders filled with papers diligently reading through each and every one of them. They met Paul Fullwood, the head of the local major crime unit at the time, who listened to the evidence they had and saw the reviews that the police had done beforehand. He thought the original hypothesis of Ruth being the killer was fanciful at best, and the more he looked at it, the more he became convinced that they needed to look into it further. Mr. Fullwood organized a cold case investigation with a new team made up of staff not involved in the original investigation. With fresh perspective, utter determination and what they deemed as a stroke of luck, a new evidence that would help solve the crime was found in the forensic archives. The crucial evidence was a piece of cellotape used to collect fibers from Ricky's clothes. In the recent years, advancement in DNA technology has played a crucial role in solving cold cases and brought justice for the victims whose killers were thought to have gotten away with it and finally bringing closure to family and friends of the victims. An unidentified DNA was found in Ricky's clothes to which forensics carried out their tests and it matched to that of none other than James Watson. At the time of Ricky's death, Watson was only 13 and lived at a children's home. He had moved from foster care to Woodgate's children's home in March of 1994 in Cambridgeshire, 20 miles away from Peterborough. On November 25, 1994, three days prior to Ricky's murder, he had asked his mother about a young child that was found dead in the woods. 
His mother having no clue what he was talking about brushed off the conversation assuring him that nobody had heard of such a thing happening but little did she know that he would be the one behind such an atrocity just three days later. Of course he was questioned by the police after several witnesses claimed to have seen them together on that fateful day but he vehemently denied it stating he was nowhere near Ricky and that he only caught a glimpse of him. The mother also said nothing about the conversation they had just some days prior of the made-up scenario of the young child in the woods that would materialize in less than a week with an almost similar description to what had actually happened. The police did not further challenge him perhaps due to ignorance or them already fancying the idea of Ruth being the killer and not some disturbed teenager. Anyway, they probably didn't know he was disturbed till later. Watson was now of course searched for and arrested in April 2016 in connection with Ricky's murder. He was by then already a serial offender with a criminal record that included stealing of cars and an arson attack at a British transport police station back in 2008. Questioned by the new investigation team about his DNA ending up on Ricky's clothes, Watson's story that he had initially given to the police was now changed. He now said that he might have lifted Ricky to help him see over a fence. This statement was what started digging him into further trouble. The police tested his claim and found footage from 1994 showing the estate being redeveloped and found that the fence was not built when Ricky Neve was still there as it was built after he was already murdered. The investigators were therefore able to prove that Watson was not only a fantasist but also a huge liar. This was however still not enough to secure his conviction and so they started to pull other pieces of evidence together. It was not long until evidence was found that he had inappropriately touched a five-year-old child when he was around 11 or 12 and his ex-girlfriend had also complained about him strangling her during sex. Two teachers also revealed how he had become so much obsessed with Ricky's murder case by showing an unnatural manner of interest in it and had even photocopied the front page of the Peterborough Evening Telegraph which covered the case. More disturbing behavior had also been noted at the children's home that he lived in that included him pleasing himself over pictures of young boys in underwear. He also kept a dead pheasant in his room and it was claimed that he had on one occasion killed a bird and spread its wings in a sinister reconstruction of Ricky's murder. After being released on police bail, he left the UK three months later in a motorhome with another bail hostel resident. He travelled to Rotterdam, then France and crossed the Pyrenees into Portugal. From France, he had reached out to his sister Claire Perna, admitting that he was in serious trouble and that he had made a massive mistake. The next time he called, he reiterated that he was in deeper trouble and urgently needed to return to the UK. He had shamelessly posted pictures of himself on social media enjoying the beaches bragging how he got out of the country. Seeing the pictures of Watson abroad which were extensively covered in the media angered Ricky's family. They knew that since he had escaped the country even after his passport had been taken, he was definitely guilty of the act. Watson was eventually re-arrested near the British Embassy in Lisbon after he was extradited back to Britain. Watson was found guilty of murder by a majority of the Old Bailey jury. Previously, the court heard how Watson's sexual interest in younger boys was known to police who interviewed him over an allegation that he molested a five-year-old back in 1993. The disturbing behavior was noted at Watson's children's home and the prosecution claimed it was no coincidence that three days before the murder, Watson was the source of a bogus radio report about a two-year-old boy being strangled and that immediately after Ricky's murder in identical circumstances, Watson obsessed over newspaper coverage of the killing, copying front-page stories at school. The jurors heard that key evidence in the case against Watson included Ricky's last meal of Weetabix taken in the morning which fixed his time of death at around noon when he was seen playing with Watson. 
It meant that Ricky was killed shortly after heading to the woods with Watson where he used to play. Watson's legal team had accused Ricky's mother but she denied any involvement. Ricky's Muddy Clark's shoes also indicated his walk into the woods was a one-way trip and not a case of being murdered by the mother and the body being dragged into the forest therefore ruling out that accusation. After a trial at London's Old Bailey that took place from January 18th to April 21st, 2022, James Watson at the age of 41 was found guilty of Ricky Neves' murder. On June 24, 2022, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 15 years by Mrs. Justice McGowan. The judge considered Watson's age at the time of Ricky's death as a significant factor in determining the sentence. In June 2023, Watson was granted permission to appeal his conviction. His lawyer argued before the Court of Appeal that Watson was not able to get a fair trial because too much of the evidence from which the killer's DNA could have been recovered was lost or destroyed in the intervening years. This case could have been solved much earlier if the official police records of six reported sexual assaults on children in the Welland estate in the three-year period before Ricky's murder had been thoroughly investigated. If the reports had been followed up, the allegation on his record of touching a five-year-old could have been a crucial lead to the police in finding the perpetrator. These failures in the investigation add to the list of the many shortcomings in this case. The verdict was a triumph for Ricky's sisters who had never thought they would see justice for their beloved brother. With the killer finally caught, the family found a sense of closure allowing them to move forward with their lives while cherishing the memory of the little boy Ricky was back in 1994. Ricky Neve will forever be remembered as a loving and caring brother and a brave and kind-hearted boy. Despite facing challenges at a young age, he showed remarkable courage, love and always protected his sisters. He deserved a life brimming with joy but tragically he endured cruelty, neglect and the ultimate horror of murder. If he had been given the love and affection he deserved, this heart-wrenching tragedy might never have occurred in the first place.